You're sweating a little bit, good for you. I chose the reading out of the message translation because every once in a while the message just calls, calls it like it is. And our director of administration, Amy Gilgenbach, who does the bulletins, came into my office and said, you're sure you want to use that reading? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sure. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. I have never been a fan of the advertisements that show up on my Facebook feed or on my Google search page when I search the internet. I always find it interesting and just a little bit unnerving that when I search on the internet for a new wallet or a Nike sweatshirt that the next time I open my computer and open up Facebook I will see multiple ads for sweatshirts and wallets on both sides of the screen. Now I know there's a little artificial intelligence, there's an algorithm that follows my internet searches and targets me with advertisements, but it still makes me nervous that some computer is tracking my internet searches and then providing me with advertising. Now, this can work to my benefit because if my wife gets on the iPad and she Googles and searches for something new, a new clothing item, and then she puts the iPad away and later I come to the iPad and open it, I obviously am not searching for a women's size medium blouse. But now I know my wife is and I can scoop in and purchase for a birthday and I am the hero. <laughs> Don't tell her I do that. It all makes sense to me until last week when I opened up my Facebook feed and as I began to scroll through the feed of pictures and comments of friends right in the middle of the computer screen was an ad for men's vitamins called Four Keeps. Pills to help you keep the hair you have. for all of the targeted advertising I get. Facebook missed the boat. The hair I already have left my head a long time ago. Such is life. Losing one's hair at 13 meant I had to come to terms with going bald. I struggled a little. My mother struggled a lot. And so, as my hairline receded, I kept going to school. And I would part it a little farther back every so often, until one day before my senior year and senior pictures, my mother decided she was going to solve my hair loss problem. And so we drove an hour to Sacramento from where we lived, because that's where my mom got her hair done. And the only person she trusted to work on my hair was her hairstylist. And so I walked in, the only man in an entire salon of women, because this was long before the days of the metrosexual and the men who go to the salon and take care of all their needs. And I sat down and I looked around and there were lots of women and I was the youngest by at least 35 years sitting in that chair. And I heard my mother say to the stylist, you know, I wonder if we do a perm, would that give him more body in the front? <laughs> and I tell this story with my mother sitting here because it is a moment of joy now. <laughs> and so this stylist, God bless her, I don't even, what was her name? Debbie, Debbie, Debbie yes. <laughs> And so Debbie smiled and started chatting with me my, as my mother, I don't even know where she went. And in the first roller, there were like 12 hairs. <laughs> and then the rollers got, you know, thicker with hair as we moved to the back. 
And so she put the rollers in, she put on the juice, and then you know what I did? I went under a dryer, and I sat under a dryer like all those ladies you see in all the places you see them. And when the dryer popped up, I went back to the chair, and Debbie undid the rollers, and she started brushing my hair, and you know what I got? I got a beautiful inch and a half high bouffant that went straight back <laughs> that did not cover anything that was receding but filled in just a little in the center. And to this day, you can see senior pictures of me sitting on the grass with our dog with a really high head of hair about an inch past my forehead. And someday, we'll pull them out but not today. Every so often, I believe, we who follow Jesus need a reminder of what that means. You're familiar with the command to the ancients, do not murder. But I tell you that anyone who is so much as angry with a brother or sister is guilty of murder. And you know the next commandment well, too. Don't go to bed with another spouse, but don't think you've preserved your virtue by staying out of bed. Your heart can be corrupted. And maybe this is the most important. Don't say anything you don't mean. This council is embedded in our traditions. You make things worse when you lay down a smoke screen. I'll pray for you and don't do it, or God be with you and don't mean it. You don't make your words true by embellishing them with a little religious seasoning. In making your speech sound more religious, it becomes less true. So when you manipulate your words to get your own way, you go wrong. Maybe following Jesus is not as difficult as others think it is. Is it possible that following Jesus is only as difficult as when we make the choice to follow the example of Jesus, to love others and value others and respect others? Last week, I found a new devotional that I have started reading online. It's called Unfolding Light. And in response to this reading from Matthew, this is what the author says. If you love the people of the world and know them as your siblings, if you care, you will clearly see injustice and you will be furious. Let your rage burn. Don't quench its flames. Let yourself be angry at what should not be the teacher. Jesus is not lulling us into a docile politeness in the face of demons in the world. But let your rage be against the demons and not against the people possessed. Ooh, that's a good line. Did you catch it? Don't be mad at the people. Be mad at what has possessed them. See how the teacher turns our mind first from being wronged to having wronged others. So before you go out to chase down the demons of others, you got to sweep your own house of your demons. You have to seek forgiveness and be reconciled to those you have wronged before you make demands of those who wrong others. So let the furnace of repentance refine your rage into desire for kindness. Some things need to be burned down, but not people. Let nothing diminish your love for wrongdoers, even as you go at what diminishes their love. Oppose the oppression, not the oppressor. Let your rage be the fire of love, not the ire of not getting your own way the refining fire of justice, not the consuming fire of anger. Let your rage be refined with sorrow because out of the death of grief, let passion rise, burning desire for love among all, and let that passion fuel your work for restoration and reconciliation. The fire of love be your courage to do justice to love mercy, to walk humbly with God. 
In other words, to borrow a phrase from a song we have sung, you can have all the rest. Give me Jesus. Like the hairline of my freshman year as it began to disappear, I spent a good deal of tr time trying to cover it up and finding a solution to my fading follicles when in reality, when I let go of what I thought I needed to keep, I found out that my bald head was actually far more attractive and easier to live with. Trust me, it is far easier for you to live with this. True as well for the words of Jesus this day. We can try to slide by the rules. We can look at what Jesus offers and say that we honor the meaning of the law without actually following the law, but what a life of challenge we carry on our shoulders. Because to speak words of hate causes pain. All of us know that. Either because we have been the recipient of such words or because we have spoken them. Well, if it's just a long conversation of sharing, then it's, then it's not adultery, right? If it looks, if it is a look that dis demeans or objectifies another human being, that's okay because, well, I won't act on the look and they don't necessarily know that I even gave them a look. How easy it is for our heart to tell us that there's something better. How easy it is for our head to believe it. And then there is that moment in conversation when the lie is easier to tell than the truth. When being polite feels better than being honest. And what does it look like when we decide not to stand up for what we believe when someone else decides they are right and everyone else is wrong? when there is no space for honest dialogue between us, when we win by maneuvering and misapplication instead of by truthful conversation and thoughtful dialogue, I want to run once again to the line of the song, you can have all the rest, you can have all this world, give me Jesus. Look at what I've done for you today, Moses says. I've placed in front of you life and good and death and evil, and I command you today, love God, walk in God's ways, keep God's commandments, and live joyfully blessed by God. But I warn you, if you have a change of heart or you refuse to listen obediently or willfully go off to serve other gods, you will most certainly die. Man, you can never hear that enough. Can I tell you? We live in a world that wants to walk the middle of the road and nobody does it well. And then every so often I get stuck where I cannot live on the middle of the road. Last year we celebrated five funerals in an entire year. This year we celebrate our fifth funeral tomorrow as we celebrate the life of Pat Dahlman. And last Sunday I left worship, I got in my car in the middle of that crazy snow and I went to Pat's house where her daughter and son were keeping vigil. And I sat down next to her and I prayed and we read scripture. And then I brought communion out. And we celebrated communion around her bed and because she wasn't able to swallow very well, I took one of those mouth moistener sponge and I dipped it in the little cup of wine and I put it to her lips and with all the strength she could muster, she closed her lips to take the sweetness of that wine into her mouth. There is no middle of the road in that moment. This is life and death and resurrection. And if we stand in the middle of the road, then the power of death keeps 
part of its power. No matter how long Jesus hung on the cross, no matter how empty the grave is. Because if we do not live in the promise of the resurrection and the gift of eternal life, if we do not look at our family and our friends and our career and all the things that drive us nuts in this world and every voice that claims to want our attention and say, where is my whistle? Stop! It's about death and dying to all those old things so that resurrection can come and Jesus can deliver us into this new life. And if that's really what we want, and if that's really what God has offered, then all we need to remember this day is the end of Deuteronomy. Choose life so that you and your children will live. Choose life, the life that God promises you in the waters of baptism, where water and God's word offer the promise of eternal life. Choose life, the life that God promises you while hanging on a cross, where the power of death comes to an end. You know what's coming. Help me out. Choose life, the life that God promises you when you gather around God's table where bread and wine are shared and the presence of Jesus is given. And even though we may sing all are welcome when we don't all believe it, God actually does. Where we speak the truth not as we want, but as God tells us it is. And letting our yes be yes and our no be no, we let go of who we think we want to be because God has called us to be more than we ever thought we could be all along. And if the struggle is real, if you are feeling like a hot mess this morning, if you're sweating under your armpits just a little bit right now, if today is tougher than you thought it would be, well then, my friends, you are welcome to borrow the words of the song I keep singing. You can have all the rest. Just give me Jesus. Join me. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all the rest. Give me Jesus. And when I come to die, And when I come to 
to die. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Amen.